It's my pleasure today to uh, introduce you uh, Professor Pete Hovey. Pete Hovey uh, now is working in Italy. It's, uh, I can say that he's an NLP researcher that I followed since my time. Since I was a PhD because uh, uh, he's uh, started working on how to measure uh, the confiability of uh, annotations. So it's a topic that uh, interested to me some time ago. So he's uh, one of the authors of the of the two names. Okay, and then he progressed uh, in other research topics. Um, now the most important one is uh, to study okay, ethical topics in NLP. Um, computer science or social science in computer science or to study some sources of bias in uh, on data that I guess that uh, I think it's uh, a hot topic now that we are now discussing this uh, uh, movement of ethica ethical artificial intelligence towards the uh, artificial intelligence and so on. And also okay, I have to say that uh, uh, I know that uh, this is from Damsa, where I worked some years ago. Okay, I spent two years there. Okay, so maybe think, uh, we can speak before, uh, after, afterwards, of when we met about Damsa. Yeah. So I will not uh, uh, steal more time. So, Dick, when you want, okay, you can start your talk. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eugenio. Uh, yes. Uh, Thank you also for the uh, shout out to Mace, which will actually make an appearance in, uh, in the talk. Uh, glad, always glad to hear that, that people are using it. Uh, okay, so let me share my screen. I hope you can see the presentation and uh, I hope you can also see the transition. So I'm gonna transition to the first slide now. Does that work? Yes, no, do you see the, the second slide with machine translation? Yes. yes okay, great. Um, if you have questions, please feel free to ask questions uh, in between. Um, maybe it's easiest if uh, Eugenio, if you can read the questions and, and just uh, interrupt me and, and say, oh, there's a question or if the, yeah. if the people want to interrupt themselves and, and talk, but uh, I don't know what, what the easiest mode is if you you know just write them write the questions and you can you you collect them and we can have them in between but also i know we have some time afterwards to to discuss okay. but either way i welcome questions okay actually let me go back to the first to the to the title slide so um thanks so much for having me thanks for the invitation uh, i'm very happy to talk about uh, this topic uh, of bias in general in natural language processing uh, and what to do about them. Uh, so I don't want to just leave us with the impression that you know everything is bad and we can't do anything. There's a lot we can do and that we should do. So um, what, we, what we're now at is like a, a fork in the road. So natural language processing has never been as successful as ubiquitous as it is now. We basically have a, a little translation tool in our pocket at all times and it works really well i mean you know as a non-native speaker of italian i can attest to the fact that you know this this has gotten me through a, a lot of uh, tricky uh, situations moving to a new country um, and that wasn't always the case right a couple of years ago machine translation wasn't uh, anywhere near the standard it is now we also have capabilities in text generation. This is an example uh, from GPT-2. By now we even have GPT-3 with even more capabilities. So NLP now can not only uh, understand and translate text, it can also generate text that looks coherent and cohesive and really very much like uh, what we would uh, produce. So really NLP in many ways is very, very close to human capabilities of language generation and understanding or much, much closer than it was before. But with great power comes great responsibility. And now that, you know, we're no longer some obscure discipline uh, of, you know, sitting in an ivory tower thinking about a small academic problem, but we're actually producing tools that go out in the world and that are used by millions and millions of people every day. We need to think about what those systems entail and what kind of issues might creep in. 
And these systems do have biases. So some of you might remember uh, Thai AI, which was an example by Microsoft AI, where they were trying to build a chatbot that would learn by interacting with people on Twitter uh, and thereby get better, get more fluent, get more natural. They started out having Thai being sort of a having the personality of a, of a teenager being very friendly, outgoing, but by interacting with people uh, within 24 hours, sadly, Thai became, you know, very sort of biased, bigoted and racist and had to be shut down after a day because apparently the internet is a bad place. Who would have thought? But that shows how susceptible our systems are to a lot of these biases that are around in the world. The, the world is not perfect and our systems that learn from them do pick up on these imperfections, on these biases, on these issues. There are other uh, problems that you know our tools do not understand everybody. This uh, guy here is a native speaker of Scottish English, uh, so he's a very strong Scottish accent when he speaks English. Uh, not impossible to understand for us, for human speakers, but apparently for smart speakers, completely incomprehensible. So he has three smart speakers there, he's trying to get them to interact with him. He can't even get them to turn on. So for him, that's a complete failure, right? And our systems have this bias that they expect people to speak in a certain way. And if they don't, then the system simply doesn't work. So that leads to a situation where, you know, NLP for all its, uh, you know, ubiquity and all its power that it has right now only really works for a very small slice of the population uh, and not, you know, a lot of other people. Generally, that slice of the population looks and sounds a lot like me, uh, middle-aged, white, college-educated, male, uh, you know, speaks sort of standard American-ish English. If you're in that group, then great, NLP works well for you. If you're not, then your uh, experience might vary quite a bit, actually. And that poses a couple of challenges to us as a field, uh, the field of natural language processing. We need to gain and then maintain the trust of our users in the technology we put out. Uh, we need to make our tools understandable and explainable. We, we need to make sure that people know why they got a certain result uh, rather than just be left with it as you know, uncontrovertible truth. Um, because people need to be able to have a recourse. If you go to a bank and your loan application for a loan is denied, then you can talk to somebody, you can demand to talk to the manager, you can you know, seek recourse, you can try and get the situation explained or you know, even rectified. But how do you argue with an algorithm? We need to be able to make our tools more human in those ways. Um, and we need to, above all, make sure that our tools are fair, that they work for everybody and not just a small slice of the population. So how are we going to do that? Well, um, in this talk, I want to give an overview. I want to talk about some basic uh, concepts and ideas in bias, a little bit about privacy, although that would be a, a whole different topic, could be a different talk. Um, I want to talk about five sources uh, that can creep in of bias, that can creep into our NLP systems. Uh, I want to talk about what these biases do to our systems and how we can apply countermeasures. Now, I want to give you an overview here, so that has to maintain, you know, a fairly high level. If you want to delve deeper into this, uh, Devin Shaw, Andy Schwartz, and I recently released a paper uh, with an overview uh, at ACL. We've been working on this paper for about two years um, to develop a, a mathematical framework and an overview of biases, which I will, you know, base this talk on. Um, but, you know, there, if, if you want to go there, there's a lot more detail there, and I'd invite you to read that paper. I should also say, uh, this is an overview, and I will cite a lot of work from a lot of different people. Uh, I would like to state here that I was not involved in all of that work. I wish I was, uh, but there aren't enough hours in the day. Uh, there are a lot of great ideas out there. It's, it's very, very uh, encouraging to see that so many people in the NLP community are working on these things. And because of that, I will also miss things. So this paper I mentioned, we worked on for two years because every six months when we thought, oh, now we have everything in there, another batch of papers came out and we thought, oh no, we need to cite these papers too. 
So, uh, you know, just a disclaimer, this is by no means complete. Luckily, uh, and, you know, leaving things out is not an indictment. It just means it's hard to keep up. So let me start out with a couple of basic concepts that are, are gonna come back to us again and again. So the first one is bias itself. I should point out that bias doesn't necessarily mean something is bad. Uh, a bias is just a preset, or if you are in a, a Bayesian framework, a bias is the prior, right? What should we expect to see bar any other evidence? What is our, our preconceived notion? What is our base rate? What is our an expectation of things to be before we see any data. And that is neither good nor bad, that just is something. Um, if you cross the street and you see something fast approaching from the right, you will automatically jump back and out of the way. And that's a, a bias, that's a preset. And it's very helpful because you probably avoid getting run over by a car. The problem with biases is when those presets sort of uh, replace evidence-based approaches or when they sort of take on a life on their own. I should also say that uh, work on ethics in NLP is much, much more than bias. Uh, there's a lot of uh, other work that goes into this, uh, and there are some more papers coming out to this. Uh, so even though I will talk a lot about bias, um, and although that is an important part of ethics in NLP and in AI, uh, it's not the only part. So you know, I just want to not give that wrong impression. Um, in the paper and throughout the talk, I will uh, talk about uh, different types of disparity. One is outcome disparity. Uh, so this is uh, exemplified best by the papers by Hendricks et al. and Zhao et al. Uh, where they showed that based on the different domains, uh, agents have uh, different outputs. So there's a disparity in the outcome based on uh, the input domain. So they found if they're trying to predict the gender of an agent in a, in a picture, when the picture is in the kitchen, the systems predominantly predict women. Uh, when the system is in the snow, for some reason, the system uh, predominantly predicts men. So we have disparate outcomes uh, for different uh, domains here. There's also an error disparity, um, which uh, is exemplified by the Wall Street Journal effect. So uh, Wall Street Journal was you know, one of the first resources that uh, parsers and taggers were trained on. And um, what we see is that anything that differs from this uh, standard, perceived standard of the Wall Street Journal gets analyzed worse. So uh, this is not a real graph, this is more of a, a cartoon to uh, exemplify this. So if we have a sentence like not definitely sure yet, our part of speech taggers will perfectly analyze this. No problem because it is very similar to the Wall Street Journal. The further we go away from this standard, uh, for example, with a sentence like this, not therefore show yet, um, we will have more errors. So there is a disparity in the errors our systems make uh, depending on the uh, input, the types of errors we get. And the issue here is that these, this different distance from the standard correlates very strongly with demographics. So, take a note here. Um, I will also talk about uh, ideal distributions. That's something that comes up in the paper. Uh, ideal distributions are uh, something we strive to model. Um, I should say this is not uniform. It's not always the case that everything is the same for everybody. For example, uh, the size of clothes, right? They're, not everybody should wear M. Uh, that you know will work for a lot of people, but not for everybody. There's a normal distribution over clothes size, for example. Um, and this varies from application to application, uh, and it will hopefully become clearer over the course of the talk. Uh, this gives us a, a way to sort of tune our systems to sort of, uh, it is a normative element to, to let us as designers decide how we want our systems to behave and who we want to serve with these systems. Um, normative leads us also to this description uh, to this distinction with uh, descriptive approaches or descriptive ethics. Uh, so something can be normatively and descriptively wrong or right at the same time. Normative is how we want the world to be, uh, how we you know desire what we strive for. Uh, descriptively is how we find the world, right? 
So uh, here's this now infamous example of a uh, translation where uh, the English sentence, she is a doctor, he is a nurse, gets translated into Turkish. In Turkish, uh, he and she does not exist. It co is collapsed into o, which we could think of as someone. So there's no distinction in the gender. Um, and then when you translate it back, uh, we see that the sentences have flipped the gender. So now he is a doctor and she is a nurse. This is normatively wrong. We don't want our systems to uh, prescribe who can be a doctor and who can be a nurse. Everybody should be free to choose. But it's also descriptively wrong. This is not what the original sentence intended, right? So the system here is taking a stance when, you know, it should just say, oh, I actually can't make a decision. Things can also be, uh, we can feel like they're wrong, that we disagree with them normatively, but they describe a state of the world. And for example, auto completions might reflect something that we don't normatively agree with. We don't want to presume that all Americans are fat, um, but it tells us something about how uh, the world is perceived by people. And you know, sociologists and other social scientists are using these properties of, for example, word embeddings, as we'll see later, uh, to find out something about society. And that brings us uh, to the biggest issue with our tools, and that is dual use. When we design a, an NLP system, it's similar to a knife. There is an intended use, something we want to do with it. Uh, for example, analyze language, create a chatbot, translate things. But then there are unintended consequences. So a knife can be used to you know, cut meat and butter a bread, but it can also kill somebody with it. When we design a tool, we have an intended use in mind, but people might use it for very, very different uh, purposes. And that is something we increasingly need to be aware of uh, when we put out our tools. And now there are you know, uh, efforts to put out ethics statements at the end of papers to really you know, help raise the awareness of this. And so that out of the way, uh, we get to the first part of my talk, to the sources of bias, the five sources of bias we have uh, identified. So an NLP system at the very abstract level works like this. We have some data that's coming in, which is encoded in a dense or sparse representation these days usually dense as word or sentence embeddings, uh, and then passed into a classifier of some sort, and out comes our analysis. Uh, could be uh, you know, part of speech or parse analysis, like here, named entity, translation, whatever it is. Right? Now, there are several points in this process where bias can creep in. The first one is the data itself. Where does the data come from? What does the data represent? The second one is the annotation. Where do the labels come from? Who is giving us the labels? Uh, what kind of labels are we requesting? Then there are the representations, word embeddings, uh, and what they capture above and beyond the meaning of words. And we will see that there are quite a lot of those things. The classifiers or models uh, that you know we think do one thing, um, but they might do the right thing for the wrong reasons. Uh, and sometimes it's not always clear until you know, we find a case where it becomes obvious that, that the tools are not doing actually what we thought they do. And last but not least, there's us. So the way we think about our models, the way we design our systems can introduce bias that you know, was not intended because we you know, weren't aware of it or didn't pay attention to something. What I want to do is walk through those five sources of bias, give some examples, uh, and uh, talk about what we can do. Now, the first four sources, everything except bias, is also covered in the paper that I've mentioned before. And we have come with a much more rigorous uh, mathematical framework for these things uh, that involves sort of the disparity in distributions. I want to show you the outline here, and I will refer you back to the paper because we wouldn't be able to get too much into it uh, during the talk, just to sort of link it back there. So let's start with the first type, the first source of bias from the data, which we call selection bias. Now, language varies among people. And uh, if you grew up in a small town that was only populated by old men, 
you would think that language works a certain way. So the first time you met somebody from a different town or you know, the, the big city somewhere far away, you would be very surprised uh, when you hear them talk. And something similar is happening with our models. Uh, the sample of data that they're trained on sort of predisposes them to expect language to go a certain way. And if they meet somebody who sounds different from what they're used to, they kind of have trouble. And, you know, this can lead to uh, problems and unhappiness of the user. We've shown in the past that uh, this can lead to exclusion of entire demographic groups. So we looked at part of speech taggers, uh, five different part of speech taggers, and how they perform on samples, Twitter samples that contain markers of African American vernacular English. So African American vernacular English is a variety of American English that has, you know, several phonological, morphological, syntactic, and semantic features that make it very distinct. It's, a, it's its own dialect or ethnolect. Um, and a lot of people, people speak and, more importantly, also write it, uh, especially on social media. Now, we tested these five classifiers, and on average, they got an F1 of 72.6%, which is not great. You could say, well, maybe that's just because it's Twitter, and Twitter is difficult to analyze. But if we looked at all the samples that did not contain African-American vernacular English, we actually got a much, much better and significantly better performance. Still not great, but a lot better. If we uh, place that on a map, we can see that you know, the, the average performance is much lower per state uh, in the southeast of the United States, which has a much higher uh, percentage of the population of African-American vernacular English speakers. So what our tools do is they exclude large parts of the population of those states from access to good performance of our tools based on the way they speak. We see a similar effect uh, for age. So we looked at the part of speech performance uh, for I think three post uh, for German and English for two different age groups over 45 and under 35. And again, what we see is that the tools perform much, much better for the older age group over 45 than for the younger one. Not by a lot, but significantly so, and in both languages and across three different post taggers. And, you know, this is an interesting fact. Normatively, this is not what we want. We want all age groups to be served equally. Descriptively, we learn something about language change and about how language has the norm of language has changed between the socialization of the older group and the younger group, probably also because of the internet. However, if we look at the distribution of over age groups in the world, we see that you know, more than 50% of the world now are under 35. So not you know, analyzing their language correctly is actually a very bad strategy, also from a business perspective and definitely from a fairness perspective. We also see uh, that, you know, based on uh, data samples, coreference tools are incapable of linking the pronoun her to the mention the surgeon, presumably because they haven't seen any examples of female surgeons in the data, uh, but basically now excluding uh, people based on their gender, based on the training data. In the paper, we basically say that this is a mismatch between uh, the distribution of the attribute in the training data and the ideal distribution that we want to see in the target data, where the ideal distribution is the distribution over uh, ethnic groups or dialects, over age groups, and over gender. Uh, I will use this slide uh, whenever I introduce uh, somebody had an idea. Now, again, I didn't have all of these ideas, I wish, but you know, uh, I couldn't get everybody who had good ideas to make a stupid picture of themselves. So I just, you know, you, you'll just have to use uh, my stupid face as uh, the symbol for somebody had an idea. One is to, you know, include this demographic variation, this, you know, differences between different groups into the text representations, into the, the input data themselves. So uh, in this case, I actually did this study a long, long time ago. Um, where I basically compared systems that were trained on uh, just normal input that didn't discriminate by age and gender, and system that had uh, separate inputs for different age or gender groups, and then at test time used the one that was appropriate for the user. 
Uh, I did this for five different language varieties, Danish, French, German, British, and American English. And I tested it over three different uh, tasks, sentiment analysis, genre uh, detection, and gender classification or age classification. And what we see across the board, yes, the numbers aren't great. This is not state of the art, but systems that are aware that uh, people of different ages speak differently and use the appropriate representations actually do a lot better uh, than the ones that are unaware of it. And the same holds true also for gender across all of these three tasks. So that is encouraging to see. So one takeaway from this is simply that we need to be better in selecting our data in representing the different groups that you know, speak language in different ways. However, uh, also I should say, this is something that social sciences have been doing for a long, long time. Uh, selection bias is a, is a big topic there and people are much more aware and, and much more concerned about it than we have been in NLP. But because language keeps changing, selecting better samples, which is something we should do, is not the, uh, the, the end all and be all, it's not the silver bullet. It will not solve all our problems. We have to do some more things, unfortunately. Another idea is uh, to basically make the different sources of bias, of demographic bias, explicit for future researchers, but also for ourselves. Uh, Bender and Friedman have come up with a uh, suggestion, which they call data statements. So if you're releasing a new data set, you should explain how the data was collected, who were the people that you know, are represented in this data, uh, what are the demographics, who were the annotators, if it's annotated, what is the situation in which it was collected, uh, and so on and so forth. And this can help us ourselves to basically get a better handle on what should we be aware of when we work with this data, but also future researchers that you know pick up this data set and might have the benefit of hindsight to know that certain things uh, you know can cause bias in our models. And that uh, concludes this first part. Uh, were there any questions? I think I saw something pop up. I don't know whether there were any questions in the no. chat. No. Okay. Not the question. Okay. Go on. Ah, okay. All right. Okay. So that brings us to the second part uh, label bias, uh, issues that arise through the annotation process. So there are different ways in which annotators can disagree with each other. The first one is uh, so we have a sentence, it is on social media. We're trying to part of speech tag the sentence, uh, and one person just doesn't care about the task. Just you know has no clue what's going on. Just simply chooses you know the default option X, and the other annotator maybe is an expert, knows really what they're doing, uh, and chooses something else. Uh, this is based on a real example. This is my dear colleague and friend Barbara Planck, uh, and this you know was something we did back then. But there are other cases of, of disagreement between annotators. Maybe you know, people have very strong opinions and maybe they systematically disagree, not because one of them is an idiot or doesn't care as in the previous example, but because they're both right. So if you look at this, uh, social media, do you think social in social media is an adjective or a noun? If we were in a room together, I would ask for a show of hands uh, and you know, typically you get a pretty even 50-50 split. Some people say, oh, it's definitely an adjective. And the other person says, uh, no, it's definitely a noun. And that depends a little bit on the lexicalization. Do you think social media can still be analyzed as two words or is it just one concept? In which case, you know, it would be a noun case. If it's analyzable, it would be uh, a noun compound. If it's analyzable, it's a noun phrase. So social should be an adjective. Annotators can uh, be biased in even more ways, uh, one of them being that they're not familiar with uh, speech conventions, with linguistic conventions. So Sapp et al. showed that uh, many annotators incorrectly label some things as hate speech that were not hate speech at all, that just contain words that those annotators thought were rude or offensive when in fact they were just, you know, part of the normal uh, way of people in expressing themselves. Um, Think about how you talk to your best friends or if you have siblings to your siblings. Um, 
you, know, you might say things to those people you're you know familiar and, and comfortable with that you wouldn't use in a normal formal conversation right and this is something we also see with annotators so what can we do about it well one of the earliest things we can do is just to train our annotators and make sure they understand what the task is what we expect from them what the labels are and what we mean when we say adjective or noun or hate speech or not hate speech so that should be very basic but you know still it's it's a step that you know we not always take in general uh, what we have here is another mismatch between distributions uh, so uh, there is a distribution over labels that the annotators give us and then there is the ideal distribution that is out there in the world uh, over hate speech over adjectives nouns uh, whatever and those two do not match up so what we, can we do about it there is a lot of work uh, going back a, a long time uh, to address the first kind of bias to find annotators that are less reliable than others maybe because they were distracted or tired or because they just didn't understand the task well or because they don't care about our task and just want to you know be paid for it um, and these are generally models of annotation, generally Bayesian models of annotation. Um, and one of them is MACE. So uh, as mentioned before, um, the idea here is simple. They, we presume that there is one correct answer for each of our uh, labels. Um, and some annotators are experts. They know that truth and will put it down. Uh, some others just don't know what they're doing. They sort of blindly guess or have some strategy that they follow. And the trick would be to figure out who of the annotators is what, and then based on that, what is the likely truth? What is the likely correct answer? Uh, you can download MACE, and now you can actually use it even online as an online tool. We just uh, released that. Um, so if you don't even want to download and run it, you can do it online. What we see with using these uh, Bayesian models of annotation is that we can get a better sense of how good the annotators actually are. There's a much stronger correlation with their true proficiency, if we were to know it. Uh, these are obviously experiments where we do know the true answer and just see how well people can be constructed and how well these different tools capture it. Uh, Bayesian models like MACE capture it much better than inter-annotator disagreement measures. Uh, but we also see that using these tools works a lot better downstream in the case of performance than using majority voting. If we ask five people and three of them agree um, on one answer, that doesn't mean that all of these people are right uh, if all of them just randomly guessed and just happened to all guess the same answer, same wrong answer. But what to do about the second part where, you know, one of or both of our annotators, all of our annotators are right, and there just simply isn't one correct answer. In that case, an approach like MACE doesn't work, right? What we can do here is model the uncertainty. Maybe we can say we, we shouldn't use hard labels, we should use soft labels. We should accept that there is more than one correct answer. There's a distribution over correct answers rather than a hard one zero uh, sort of one hot encoding over answers. Uh, so some of these categories, you know, people confuse sometimes because they are very similar and they have valid theories of grammar in their head. Some of these, they never confuse. People never, you know, think that a determiner is a verb or the other way around. So if we can capture these disagreements, if we can know what is difficult for people, we can let our tools know during training, hey, look, um, if you made a mistake and confused a noun for a verb, people never do that. So we make the full update to our model, to our uh, model parameters. But you know, some categories are easy to confuse for each other, and both of them might be right. So if a lot of people make that mistake, then we should allow our model to also make that mistake. And so we make a smaller update. We allow for both solutions. If we use that, uh, we see a lot of, uh, or we see some small but significant improvements. Uh, we basically see that our models learn to keep an open mind and that there is more than one correct answer. 
Now, all of that kind of breaks down when we do our standard evaluations, because we still go and evaluate uh, on a hard basis, like zero, one, is this the correct answer or not? Uh, but we can see that, you know, it helps uh, make our models more generalizable and sort of uh, accept that there's more than one correct answer. Recently, uh, we explored whether we could also model this with multitask models. So we have a main task that we're trying to solve, part of speech, named entity, sentiment analysis. And then uh, we have a second auxiliary task where we basically try to predict for each item, for each instance, how much will, will different annotators agree on, disagree on this. Uh, and that way, we're not only trying to predict the task, we're also trying to predict how difficult uh, is this instance. Uh, and we see if we include that, we actually get uh, significant improvements over standard methods. So that brings us to the third source of bias after data uh, and annotation. We have the representations that we put into our models and here representations are mostly uh, embeddings. Obviously, I don't have to explain to, uh, to you what embeddings are. Uh, I assume everybody is very familiar at this point um, about the analogy tasks uh, and the associated biases that come in there, uh, which sort of have you know, traces of sexism and even racism um, baked into those systems. Uh, there has been some valid criticism to say that, well, these analogy tasks might not be the best way to evaluate these embeddings, but still, uh, it stands to reason that you know, these models capture a lot of the biases that we as speakers of a language, we as society, encode in language in the way we use language and in the way we talk about race or gender. Uh, there are some interesting papers that use this to track how societies have changed their attitudes over time. Uh, but as an input to a predictive model, this poses a problem. And very early on, people have had the idea to de-bias those vectors. So basically break some of those symmetries uh, to not uh, make one answer more likely than another in one of these uh, uh, analysis tasks. However, uh, Gornan and Goldberg said, well, yes, that's all fine and well, you can do that, but you're basically just putting lipstick on a pig. Uh, we can still reconstruct those biases. We can still you know, find those differences in how we speak about race and gender and other things, because we're not really modeling the world we want with these embeddings. We're still modeling the world we have with all its imperfections, with all its uh, stereotypes, with all its biases. And you know, unless we do something about that, our embeddings are liable to pick up on those things uh, and you know, put them forward. Uh, we recently did a study where we looked at um, BERT um, and like other models, language models that sort of capture contextualized embeddings. Uh, and we saw that, you know, in almost 5% of uh, using these models to complete a sentence that was gendered, uh, they would use a hurtful stereotype. Um, if the target is female in 10%, uh, it referred to sexual promiscuity. Uh, and if the target was male, in many cases, it referred to homosexuality in a negative uh, derogatory way. So these tools you know, pick up also on these stereotypes, on these lingering preconceptions uh, that we have as, as uh, societies uh, and uh, proliferate them and, and keep, basically keep them alive and bring them into our models. Unfortunately, this is the part where there is not a lot of good, available, easy work to address these biases. Um, it's good to be aware of them and to you know, work with or against them. Um, but we haven't found a, a lot of good ways to address this other than becoming better societies. So this brings us to the fourth source of bias, which is the model itself. Now, when we train a model, the model essentially has to assume that the data we give it is representative, the IID assumption, the training data is representative for what we will see later on, um, and that it is reliable with respect to the annotation. But I've just spent the better part of mm, half an hour trying to convince you that neither of these two things are true and that there's a lot of examples uh, that they aren't true. So what will the models do? 
Well, there was some interesting work by uh, Kirichenko and Mohammed that showed that these models actually uh, will take these biases and amplify them. So what they did was they tested, I believe, up to 200 sentiment analysis tools and valence uh, tools and showed that if you just change the gender of the pronoun in a sentence, it doesn't change the meaning of the sentence, but it does change uh, the uh, sort of uh, evaluation of the model. So here they found that if you use a male pronoun, negative connotations, negative emotions have a much stronger uh, value uh, than for female pronouns. And you could argue, well, maybe this is actually a normatively correct effect in the real world. Most of uh, perpetrators of crimes, of harassment, of violence are male. So maybe the models are picking up on that. But they also showed that there is the same difference for prototypically white and prototypically black uh, first names not changing the meaning of the sentence, but the model picking up on societal stereotypes uh, about ethnic groups. So there goes the, the normatively correct hypothesis. We've seen something similar recently uh, for machine translation. Uh, we looked at when you translate uh, sentences that are demographically representative into another language, what happens to those demographics, to age and gender, uh, what we saw is that um, using a, a, a classifier to, in the original language, well, we sort of approximate the true distribution over males and females in the sample. But once we translate it to English, for example, everything is out of whack. Every, you know, the tool thinks that two thirds of those, those texts were actually written by men, when in reality, only 50% were. We did the same for uh, the distribution over ages. And what we see is that uh, once we translate things, everything sounds like it was written by somebody who is much older than they actually were. And so uh, machine translation basically makes you sound like your own father, whether you want it or not. Zhao et al. Uh, had a very uh, nice paper uh, four years ago now, best paper at EMNLP, where they showed that models are not only picking up on these biases, but making them even worse, even stronger. So if they get an imbalanced data set with respect to, for example, uh, the gender of agents in a, in a scene, uh, which is you know, two thirds women, um, then at test time, they will actually amplify this bias and have an even larger percentage of predicted female agents in the scene. And this overgeneralization can lead to false positives, right? Our tools might you know, pick up on the wrong clues and then basically exacerbate things, which might be funny and a little bit confusing, but you know, at the same time could actually have very severe consequences if it's used for the wrong uh, tools, if, if the dual use case kicks in. More generally, this is very complicated or, well, it's complex. Uh, we basically have a mismatch between three different uh, distribution, the distribution of the attribute and the training data, um, the actual distribution, the ideal distribution that we want, and then the distribution at test time, and none of these match up. So this generates a lot of issues. However, we can maybe discourage our models from, you know, over amplifying these differences and from sort of creating more bias than there is. Um, Zhao et al. showed in their paper that not only there is this bias, but you can also measure it. And you can say, well, okay, maybe there are some examples, some domains like cooking that are more associated with female agents and some like shooting that are more associated with male agents. That's just what is in the data. We will accept that as a, as a prior. However, we do not want the model to exacerbate these biases at test time. We want it to stay close to the same value it had at training time. And so what they did was an integer linear programming solution uh, where they basically uh, have the model try and find a correct solution, a correct, correct number of coefficients that also respects this constraint. Other ideas are to basically make the models themselves aware of these differences uh, that can influence the outcome. Uh, there was some work uh, that we did a while back where we looked at predicting uh, mental health conditions like depression 
uh, modeling not only other mental health conditions, but also demographic factors like gender. And what we found was that uh, the tools that have access to not just uh, the other conditions, but also uh, the demographic information about gender, which we only had in 10% of the data, uh, these tools actually perform significantly better uh, in finding uh, these different mental health conditions because they have different prevalences and are expressed differently by different people. Recently, uh, Lee et al. took this idea to a, uh, its logical conclusion or one step further, uh, where they basically said, okay, well, if different people talk about different things differently, let's, let's capture that, but let's dissuade our models from picking up on it. Let's just have the models ignore those differences. So what they did is they have a multitask learning setup uh, they let the model learn part of speech or a sentiment or whatever it is, and also predict things like age, gender, and location. But then they actually reverse the gradient. So they force the model to maximize the error on predicting those uh, demographic attributes, which seems counterintuitive. Why would the model basically, why would we want the model to become bad at predicting those things? But what happens is it sort of forces the model to focus um, on the signal that is contained in the input data only for the main task and ignore all those confounds, all those demographic factors uh, that are also reflected in the data. And this is again on uh, the aged uh, part of speech tagging data that I've shown you. Their model is better, so the numbers are higher, but there still is a difference um, between the different age groups uh, in the baseline. Um, in fact, the the model performs better for the older group as it did before when I showed you, but once they use this adversarial learning, that difference basically all but disappears. Interestingly enough, it also gets better when they run it on the African American vernacular English part of speech tagging data that I've shown you before, uh, even though it hasn't been trained to learn that you know people uh, speak differently when they use African American vernacular English, the model has been trained to sort of ignore anything that's not related uh, directly to the task of part of speech tag. And that makes these uh, tools actually better and fairer. It also has the nice side effect uh, that by maximizing the error on those gender, uh, gender, age, and location prediction auxiliary tasks, it makes it more privacy preserving. It basically uh, makes it harder for the models to guess who was talking. And that brings us to the last part and maybe the most difficult, uh, which is bias creeping in through design. So what we have is uh, exposure uh, of ourselves to different languages. Um, in the world, we work with different languages and ideally we'd like to work on each of them equally, but mostly we end up working on English actually. And that you know, colors our perception uh, that has effects on how we do things. Um, there isn't a lot of data for a lot of languages. Uh, we did some study and found that before the Universal Dependency Tree Bank uh, changed that, um, there wasn't any tree bank, any part of speech data for about two thirds of the most common languages on Twitter. Uh, and there wasn't any semantic resource uh, for you know, almost 90% of them. So if you were to start out with a new idea, with a new tool, you would naturally probably first try it on English simply because, well, that's what you know, we have available data to develop and test the tools we, we built. But that leads to problems. So one idea is to basically uh, make people aware of this reliance on English uh, and on uh, and make the data, make data on new uh, languages or on other languages than English more available, uh, basically build up a resource uh, as the Universal Dependency Tree Bank has. And a study by Miskas actually shows that we as a field are pretty good at this. Uh, a lot of papers now have data included. I think this probably has even grown uh, since she ran that study. Uh, and most of, most of the time that data is actually also available in some cases, you know, people promised the data, but then forgot to put a link. Um, but, you know, 
sometimes the link doesn't work, but generally the field has been very good and has been driving uh, this uh, availability of languages other than English. Uh, in part also to uh, Emily Benders at Horsham to you know, state what we're working on. Say what language your model works for, even if it's English. Uh, there's no shame in working on English, obviously, but we shouldn't automatically assume that English is representative of all the languages in the world. Just because our tool works for English, that doesn't mean it works for other languages as well. And uh, I assume, you know, you, uh, as many of you, as well as I, who are not native speakers of English, can appreciate those differences. Because what is happening is, you know, it creates an overexposure. If uh, something is more prevalent in our mind, it's easier to think of, uh, then we sort of assume these things are bigger, better, faster, more, more important, more dangerous, more anything. Uh, if I asked you which city is bigger, New York City or Lagos, New York City is much more familiar. We sort of would first think New York is probably also bigger, when in fact it is not. Uh, but it just is more present in our mind. It's easier to think about. It's easier to access, as is English. But just because something is easier to access and work with doesn't mean it's more important. So, you know, we work a lot on American English because it's, a, because it's available. We don't work as much on Nigerian English because there isn't as much. We work a lot of on, on post-tagging, on sentiment analysis, and not as much on discourse analysis, just because, you know, we are overexposed to uh, certain things, and it's easier to get started. So one way to break this cycle and to sort of, you know, look at ourselves uh, and, and catch ourselves in, in the process of this is to think about the implications. Um, there's a recent paper by Prabhu Moye et al. where they link this to um, the rule of generalization and autonomy of uh, the people we work with. Uh, the rule of generalization is basically Immanuel Kant's uh, categorical imperative. Don't do things that you wouldn't want other people to do. Um, does it generalize what one person does? So if one person litters, that's not great, but you know, is it a problem? Well, can it scale? No, it can't. If everybody starts doing the same thing, soon enough we're actually you know, drowning in garbage. So uh, if you know, something doesn't work for uh, individuals in our tools, maybe it doesn't scale well when we use it on a lot of people. So that's something we should think about when developing them. The same thing, when we develop our tools, we're actually assuming autonomy over our users. Uh, if we translate something for somebody and make them sound like their own father, we have basically changed how they are represented subtly maybe, but still we are basically taking over some of their uh, own control over some of their agency over how they want to be perceived through language. And so this brings us to the larger ramifications of what we're doing. We need to think about how can we, you know, make our tools safe and usable for society as a large. And Van der Poel has an interesting uh, thought experiment or a different interesting approach uh, by saying, well, all new technology, AI, you know, gene editing, anything is a large experiment. It's a social experiment that we all participate in. And if it's an experiment, then it has to follow certain safety protocols, right? It has to adhere to safety of the participants, to their agency, uh, to their informed consent. Um, and obviously, this is a little bit harder to apply to, you know, like a, a translation tool that's out there in the world than it is to a social science lab experiment where we recruit participants. But it gives us a framework to think about how we want our tools to be used and, and what the ramifications are when they go out of our hands and into the world. So with that, I want to wrap up. Um, I have introduced five sources of bias that can creep into our NLP pipelines and can influence them in various ways. But I hope I've also shown you a variety of countermeasures uh, for the problems these biases uh, produce. Some of them are very straightforward and easy. They just take you know, one extra step uh, writing things down. Some of them can be addressed algorithmically with you know, different model variations. But some of them are more tricky and just require us to sit down and think about what we do ourselves and how we think about our work 
and its implications. And with that, I think if we do it as a field, we can address a lot of the goals I've outlined earlier. We can definitely make our tools fairer. Uh, we've shown, uh, we've seen throughout this uh, presentation that we can address bias and basically make our tools work for different groups to equal amounts. Uh, but that also opens up opportunities to personalize our tools. If they don't just work for people that speak a certain way, but for everybody and everybody speaks a little bit differently, that also means that our tools can now be much more tailored towards the individual user. And that opens up a whole host of new possibilities that we can use. And last but not least, throughout the talk, I hope you have seen that, you know, independent of whether we care too much about the fairness aspect of these tools, if we address the biases that are in there, we always end up with a better performance because our models are uh, more generalizable, they are less overfitting to certain circumstances. So what I want to leave you with is please be aware of uh, the biases from those five sources, data, labels, embeddings, the models themselves, and our design. Look where you can apply countermeasures and think about how our tools can be used or will be used in ways that we did not intend and would we be comfortable in having those tools being used on ourselves. And that can help us guide uh, in developing our tools and you know, making them even more uh, advantageous, even more powerful and even more ubiquitous, but in a fair and equitable way. Thank you very much. That's the end of the talk. Oh, I should say, if this is something you're interested in, um, I recently got uh, some grant from the EU to actually work on these issues. So uh, I have some postdoc positions coming up uh, in March. Uh, the, the call is open right now, um, but you know there will also be more coming up over the next five years. So if you're interested in, in this uh, or even in a collaboration, uh, please let me know. Thank you very much, Dick, uh, for your presentation. It was uh, okay, very insightful, uh, stimulating. Um, okay, for me, uh, excellent, and thank you very much uh, for it. Uh, so I think it's a question. It's time for questions. So if somebody from the audience that uh, want to make a question, okay, please write your name in the chat, okay, and open your uh, microphone. Um, go ahead. So if there are any questions. I have one question, okay, mm -hmm. because I'm writing, okay, I'm making some notes. And uh, you, you write in, in one slides about, okay, how to uh, quantify bias, okay. And for me, it's, uh, was okay. I, I I make a note. Okay, so how how do you quantify the bias? Okay, in a model because I think it's uh, when you spoke about okay uh, the bias on the model. So how can you quantify? How can you measure the bias of a of a uh, model? Yeah. Uh, so this is a, a very good question. Uh, unfortunately, one where there isn't a very good answer yet. Um, so the framework we propose allows us to um, express bias as mismatch between different uh, distributions, like a, an, a distribution that we have and a distribution that we want. If we know that distribution, then we can use very simple measures like uh, callback leibler divergence between distributions to express how large it is and you know how little it should be if, if ideally they were the same, right? Um, that's not the only way of thinking about bias and measuring quantifying bias. Uh, bias might also be how many different uh, groups, how many different user demographics does my tool serve well? How, how well is the performance on different groups and like how big is the gap? What is the sort of the, the macro average over different demographic groups? Um, there are um, some ideas that are floating around now to have evaluation suites um, rather than, you know, sort of doing our standard testing with like, uh, you know, 
F1 accuracy on, on one data set, maybe we can vary things. We can say, well, if we transform this data to sound more male or more female or younger or older or something else, do we still get the same results that we expect uh, you know, if we don't change the, the content? So maybe there are ways to sort of simulate different user groups and see what, you know, what the effect is. And that could be a different way of measuring bias. So the, uh, there isn't any, okay, a standard way to uh, measure the bias for here. So to establish or to define an ideal distribution uh, according, according to that, okay, to measure, okay, the difference uh, among your, okay, the distribution that your model reads. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, I see, I see. So, okay, are there any, okay, I don't see anybody in the, in the chat. Um, is there any more questions? Please go ahead. Okay, I guess that, that, that uh, some of your research topics, are there any, or there is any, any related, uh, that's okay. Uh, Vic, okay, I have a second question, okay, it's very yeah. interesting to know what are the different fiat, uh, sources of fiat, but okay, uh, from your expertise point, okay, if I'm going to make a model or I'm going to make uh, an experiment, what are you, the advice that you give me to not to reach fiat, okay, to make a model uh, reducing, okay, I know that it's very difficult to eliminate, uh, okay, to avoid the bias, okay, but what is the, the, the rules of thumb to prevent us from bias? That is a very good question and, and very tough. Um, I think one way to do this is to, uh, a simple way could be to test it on your own data, right? Like, do use some of your own emails, WhatsApp messages, you know, and, and see whether it works on your own data, what, what comes out if you use it yourself. Um, the other one is to see, you know, to, to sit back and, and take maybe a make it and break it approach, right? Is there a way I can stress test my model? I could, you know, come up with a variation that would change this. And this goes back to what I said earlier. Maybe there are, you know, evaluation suites we can think of, you know, simulate data that comes from different demographic groups and see whether you know that produces different outcomes. Um, so this is related to the idea of data augmentation, uh, right, and, and sort of this, this testing. The more generalizable your, your model becomes, uh, the less sort of susceptible to the individual domain, uh, the more likely your data is to not fall prey to certain biases. Uh, Barbara Plank has written a very interesting paper uh, where she argues that you know, a lot of the work we do for domain adaptation actually should also apply uh, to adaptation for other aspects, for example, age or gender or other things that are reflected in language. So you know, the difference between uh, Twitter and uh, the Wall Street Journal is reflected in the language that is used in those different domains. But, you know, text also reflects other things that, you know, you know about the yeah. speaker. And so the more, the less sort of fixed, the more diverse our sample is, the more, uh, you know, varied it is along all those different dimensions, the more generalizable and the less sort of fixated on some you know, obvious and less obvious aspects of the, the training data sample, uh, the more generalizable the data will become. Okay, I see. Thank you very much for your question. Dick, yeah. uh, we have a, a question from the one of our researchers, Anna Valdivia. Yeah. She can't open her microphone, so oh, I'm okay. going to, to introduce her, her question. Yeah. Um, she said that, uh, thank you, Thanks so much for your talk. Very interesting indeed. Uh, and the question is, are you familiar with the lipstick on a pig paper? Yeah. There, the authors claim that uh, BSEs can't be fixed. What are your reflections on that? 
Yeah, so uh, this is, uh, I, I think, one of the slides I, re I referred to that paper briefly. Um, so to some extent, what they say is true for the semantic biases. So for the biases in um, the embeddings that we have, word embeddings, document embeddings, um, I, they sent me a, a, an early draft of the paper and we had a discussion um, where we basically agreed that as long as word embeddings capture not just the meaning of words, but also the societal connotations and the biases and stereotypes that we as, you know, societies, as, as speakers of a language, reflect through language, right, our attitudes towards, uh, you know, different people, uh, generations, and so on and so forth. Um, as long as we, you know, we can't change that, these embeddings will always pick up on these things and it's very hard to overcome that. Um, so what they say is true for those embeddings. That doesn't mean you know, we're completely at the mercy of them. By being aware of it, we can have countermeasures in our models, uh, right? And there might be cases where it doesn't matter that the models also picked up on uh, you know, societal stereotypes, if that is not something that influences the performance of our models. So uh, there is a, uh, there is a, uh, an issue with that, right? So this goes back to the normative versus um, descriptively correct. Um, normatively, we would want uh, embeddings not to be biased by stereotypes and by societal attitudes, but descriptively, they will always pick up on that and, and sort of reflect where we are as a society. So it, it holds a mirror to us. Uh, but there are different other ways to uh, address this, and it might not always you know, affect the outcome of our models downstream. OK, thank you, Dirk. I guess that Anna is also saying thank you. Anna, do you have any more uh, question about it? Okay, if you want to say something, okay, write uh, please on the chat. So I think Anna is happy with the answer. Okay, sure. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> so um, I don't know if there is any more questions. So Paco, maybe, maybe you want to make a question or a comment uh, about that. Mm -hmm. I, I have interest in the in the idea of the Fernex, and I was uh, I listen at the end you were speaking about Fernex, but I would like to to study more about Fernex in the in the in this area mm -hmm. because really the uh, some of the problems really are in the of course always the, the the problems are in the data. I have interest in the preprocessing to to improve the quality of the data. Yeah, but I have not. I think it's it's very important that is an, a, a real challenge in the, in the area. Yeah, and I think as a field, we haven't really paid as much uh, attention to that aspect. I mean, you know, not, not out of ill will or anything, you know, like the, the first data sets that were available, uh, like the Wall Street Journal uh, or the Penn Tree Bank, it was just, you know, the first data that was there to do anything at all uh, with like part of speech and, and parsers, right? So it was, a, a good thing to have, you know, people probably couldn't even think about at the time that, you know, this would encode certain language norms or, you know, have like gendered bias in there. Um, so, it, you know, it's not to say that, you know, all of that was bad or, or intentional. I think we just as a field now are getting to a point where we're, where we're understanding the consequences of, you know, these seemingly innocuous, these seemingly trivial aspects uh, and that we need to, you know, sort of think about and do something about those things. Um, I think there's, you know, there's a lot of things we can do and I think, you know, there's a growing awareness in the field uh, to change this and, and address this when we collect new data and when we set up our tools and our systems. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> So thanks. So if there if there is if there isn't any any more questions, okay. So I guess it's time. To thanks again, Dick, for your time, for uh, for your talk.
And I hope that in the future, okay, you can visit again Granada and visit us in our research institute. I hope in our future site, okay, in our future building. Oh, yes. uh, and I also hope that you have the opportunity also to meet you in the college at your university, okay, to visit you there and work a little bit in this topic that I guess that it's very interesting and it will burst artificial intelligence in 2021. So thanks, Dirk. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Nick. Very me. interesting talk. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, every people, to the assistants, and see you next uh, Monday in the next seminar. So, bye bye. Bye bye, everybody. Bye bye. Stay bye, -bye. Safe. bye, -bye everybody. Ciao, ciao.